Ralph Edwards, ready to walk in on the People to People Sports Banquet, being held right now at the world-famous Hotel Astor on Times Square in New York City. Remember what happened here last year? Finally did it at the People to People Sports Banquet here at the Astor in New York. Well, I, Ralph, I think this is a sinister conspiracy. So you know why our This Is Your Life fingers are crossed tonight as I go out to pick one out of this distinguished gathering. Jack Dempsey is there, Florence Chadwick, Don Budge. There's Florence Chadwick. And Don Budge, great tennis player. And uh, Joe Lewis is there. Althea Gibson. Kyle Rote, famous footballer. Robert Moses is there, be the new president of the New York World's Fair. All their other greats present here tonight, and our cameras will prove that to you in just a moment. Our job is to pick just one. Well, let's get on with it and do it. Here we go. This is your life. So this is your life himself, Ralph Edward. Hey. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bob Warren. Hello, everyone. I, I know that uh, I know that most of you, many of you, knew that we we're going to do this is your life here from the People to People uh, uh, Sports Banquet tonight. But uh, we didn't say just uh, who it was, and I don't think more than one or two here uh, know who it's uh, going to be. Now, uh, there are so many deserving people here. How can you pick just one? Well, we thought we would do this. We thought that we would just uh, pick the champion among champions. And so, it will be you. Joe Lewis, tonight, this is your luck. Oh, hello. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Now look, did we really surprise you? Yeah. You really did. <laughs> Joe, in our time, uh, there have been many great heavyweight champions, but two, perhaps more than any others, captured the imagination of the American public. Now you were certainly one of those. Here's the other, Jack Dempsey, right here. Congratulations, Joe. Oh, <laughs> It couldn't uh, happen to a swallow fellow. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, you, of course, uh, never fought, uh, Joe, Jack. No, uh, I was lucky because Joe came long after my time. But we could have uh, made a great battle, though. <laughs> but, Joe, tonight is your life, and congratulations. It's going to be wonderful because I know Ralph surprised me about 1957, and what a night it was. Purple, Carpenter, Fred Fulton, and all the others. But let me warn you about this fellow. <laughs> Keep your guard up at all times, because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Incidentally, Ralph, who have yeah. got back of the big black book out there? Now, I'm going to duck that uh, you just threw at me there. Yeah. Uh, if you'll come with me, though, Joe, to our stage, we'll soon find out. And Jack Dempsey, thank you. Thank One you. of the great greats here. Jack Dempsey, Lucky whose life we have done. <laughs> all right, oh, and Joe, I wanted to say this, too. A very special bow to Colonel Eddie Egan. And look who's by him, Don Amici, the whole gang, to, for uh, uh, all of this, really. And uh, his uh, uh, co-sponsor, Sports Illustrated magazine, through its special events and public relations director, Keith Morris. Thank you, Keith, very much for letting us uh, join in uh, this crusade to further world peace and understanding by sending our athletes all over the world to uh, compete, a cause of the sport of all of us. Doesn't it, Joe? I right, so do. And I'm I want to thank the Colonel, too, for inviting me. <laughs> well, good boy. Come along, Joe Lewis. In the meantime, here's our good friend Bob Warren. Bob? Now, here are coming to you tonight from New York is Ralph Edwards and his guest, the former heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. Here's the man. Bob Warren. Here we go. All right, thank you, Bob. Sit down here, Joe, in our ring, as you have so many times in your career, waiting for the bell to send you shuffling out, stalking your prey. Wow. In the uh, 17 years, I thought you may get up. I was going to run, but you... Uh, I can't get up no more, man. <laughs> you can't get up no more. Well, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to get up a lot before the night's over, I think, and uh, uh, because we've got some really surprises that are going to rock you up on your feet. In the 17 years, between 1934 and 1951, you fought 71 times as a professional, winning all but three fights, 54 by knockouts. You held the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship longer than any other fighter, 11 years, 8 months, 7 days. A record for all to shoot at for years to come, Joe. <laughs> now, 
Now, to get all the answers, in your case, Joe, find out what makes a champ, let's go back to 1914, May 13th, your birthday. Where were you born, Joe? In Lafayette, Alabama. On Lafayette, a farm Alabama. near Lafayette. Lafayette. 120 acres of poor land rented by your father and mother, Monroe and Lily Barrow. Barrow. Uh, how many of you children were there, Joe? Eight. Of whom you were the seventh. Your sister Susie died some years ago, yes. and your brother Lonnie passed on just last June. Yes, but here from Detroit, Chicago, and Los Angeles are the others. Emerald, Alvanius, <laughs> De Leon, Eulala, <laughs> Bunit, and your stepbrother Pat. <laughs> Crowd in there, Robbie. Kick the stool back and get right in close to him there. That's the old fire. Now, he doesn't really remember his father. Uh, does he, Emerald? No. Dad went very hard when Joe was a baby. But Dad came very ill and was sick and was hospitalized, and Joe never saw him again. Yes, he died, actually, That's before Joe yes, he remembers before. him, I guess. For a while, your mother tried to work the farm herself, didn't she, Albania? Yes, that's right. We all kids pitched in and tried to help all we could, but it was quite too much, too hard to try make a living. Then, in 1922, when you're eight, Joe, uh, your mother marries uh, Patrick Brooks, a widower and a family friend, and that's where you come into Joe's life, Pat. That's right, Ralph. That's when we all moved into... Uh, uh, yeah. Camp Hill, yeah. Alabama, mm -hmm. and Joe started school there. Well, what kind of a school was it there in Camp Hill, Joe? Well, there was a little one-frame school there, one-room building. And, uh, in fact, I was out about four or five years ago, and it's still standing there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, was there anything about Joe as a boy that uh, showed he would someday be a great champion in the ring to Leon? Uh, I think so. He could run faster than most boys. He was bigger than himself. But yeah. Joe was mostly quiet and stayed to himself. Yes. Well, now, uh, is that right, you ladies? Oh, yes, Ralph. I used to like it myself, not never dreaming. I think you still can. <laughs> <laughs> never dreaming he had that much power, though, Ralph. Oh, I never touched it. Well, oh, but not. As a boy, did Joe get into scraps with the other boys at school, Eunice? Never. Joe really didn't like fighting. He was good to everyone. Later, when he became chap, he helped all of us. He sent me through Howard University and the University of Michigan so that I could become a teacher. He also helped to send five nieces and nephews through college. And once when Yulela was very ill for a long time, he saw that she had the very best medical care possible. He bought us cars and homes and set his brothers up in business. But most of all, Ralph, he looked after mother and dad and saw that they had the best of everything during the rest of their lives. But back here in 1925 in Camp Hill, Alabama, Joe, your uh, stepfather decides the opportunities for making a better living for his family are greater in the uh, booming northern city of Detroit. And uh, he gets a job there as a carpenter for the city and a year later sends for all of you. Now you, Joe, are 12 years old. Uh, where did you go to school there in Detroit? Do you remember, Joe? Our uh, first school was Duffield. Yes, and then you went to a trade school. Yes, yeah, Brownstone. Brownstone's trade school. To prepare yourself for a job That's right. at one of the automobile plants. But your mother had equal ambitions for you, didn't she? <laughs> she showed that, but she wanted me to become a violin player. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Joe did study the violin for a while, didn't he, you, Leila? Yes, Joe studied the violin for a while. And Mama used to give him a dollar a week to uh, take these lessons until one day the teacher showed up and Joe hadn't been to class at all. I wonder what had happened to him. Yeah. And that's when Mother found that instead of going to the violin lessons, Joe had been using the dollar to pay for boxing lessons at Brewster Center. <laughs> your stepfather was uh, opposed to your nightly workouts at Brewster Center, wasn't he? Well, he wanted me to get more rest and, and also to, to so I'd be able to, to learn more in school. <laughs> well, he thought Joe would never amount to very much if he kept hanging around. Well, how did your mother feel about it, Eunice? Well, when Joe told Mother that what he wanted most was to be a fighter, she was quite upset. But later, when she found that he really had his heart set on it, she said, very well, if you want to be a fighter, then be a good one, and I will help you all that I can. At 16, you quit school and work at odd jobs around Detroit. Each night finds you coming down the steps of the family home and turning down Madison Street toward Brewster Center and your nightly workouts in the ring. One such night, a 10-year-old neighborhood youngster falls in beside you. Uh, Joe, he says, 
Uh, how about going to the gym with you? And you say, okay. And a half block later, the boy says, Joe, how about letting me carry your bag for you? And again, you say, okay. Now, as time goes by, this comes to be an almost nightly ritual. And here's the kid who lived down the block from you in Detroit. In the early 30s, former welterweight and middleweight boxing champion of the world, Sugar Ray Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it. Go ahead. You can take it. Ralph, <laughs> <Well, laughs> yeah. most every boy has an idol, and honestly, I'm so proud to say that Joe is my idol, and still is. It seems as though it was only yesterday, man, and we were back in Detroit down at Booster Center, and I was watching you go through the paces there. Boy, was I fascinated. He can always punch, Ralph. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, my parents moved to New York, and. Uh, I lost contact with Joe. I didn't hear from him again until, I think it was 1935 when he came to fight okay. Conera. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started up to the training camp at Pompton Lakes, watching this guy again, banging the bags around, and <laughs> the sparring partners. Gee, did I, I'm telling you, I wanted to be so like this guy. Do you? But everything I learned about boxing, all of the good clean habits and training hard and clean living, I honestly learned from Joe. And I say, this is another thing. You know, if it hadn't been for you, I just might not have been a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Prize well, fighting. You, you, but you're the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Prize fighting would have lost a great champion, Ray, if you hadn't have been a fighter. Believe me. Uh, he deserves a hand. Let's give him a big one, this guy. I know Joe's mighty happy to see you here tonight, Sugar Ray Robinson. We'll be seeing you in Los Angeles on December 3rd in your fight with uh, Gene Fulmer. And our thanks again, too, to you and to uh, sisters and brothers here, Emerald, Alvanius, DeLeon, Eulela, Eunice, and Pat. Thank you very much. Now, in a moment, Joe Lewis, we'll trace your ring career from your first uh, amateur fights to the world crowned and beyond. Lots more surprises for you and for all our viewers. But first, here again is our good friend, Bob Warren. <laughs> Here again are your, this is your life host, Ralph Edwards, and former heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. The year, 1932, the place, the Detroit Athletic Club. Now, this is your first amateur fight, Joe, is the middleweight representative on the Brewster Center team. Your opponent is Johnny Myler. Now, uh, how did you make out that night, Joe? <laughs> Not so good. <laughs> <laughs> you got knocked down seven times. That's right. In two rounds, I think. Uh, Not yet the Joe Lewis the world is to idolize someday, but your instructor at Brewster, Atler Ellis, is far from discouraged. You more than justify his faith by winning your next 13 bouts by knockouts. Right. I saw a lot of Joe in his amateur fights in Detroit, and I was greatly impressed by his potential hitting power. The man who has become your co-manager and lifetime friend and who helped pilot your career to world fame. From Detroit, here's John Roxborough. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Mr. Roxborough, how did Joe do as an amateur while you were watching him develop? Well, he did all right, Ralph. He's proved to everybody and to myself that he had that hitting power. And Fifty-eight of his amateur fights, he won 54 of them, and 43 were knockouts. Hmm. He had a dynamite left jab, a wonderful, fast, clever left hook that was a real knockout punch. And, and this it. right hand, <laughs> when that connected, it was the absolute, it was the kiss of death. I was wondering when you were going to get to that. <laughs> uh, when did Joe decide to turn pro, John? Well, after he uh, was in the inner city Golden Glove matches in Chicago in 1933, he came to me then, and as a 19-year-old kid, and said, I want to turn pro. I said, okay, Joe, I'll get you a good manager and a trainer. He said, no, just get me a good trainer. You be my manager. <laughs> and I insisted that he gets his brother's permission. Then we called up Julian Black. And here he is, Joe, your good friend and co-manager with John Roxborough, <laughs> Julian Black of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on down here, fellas, and tell us now, what was the next step, Julian? Well, uh, Ralph, our first big problem was to get the best trainer available we could find. So we were fortunate to get the late Jack Blackburn. And I think that Jack uh, did more for Joe in his entire career and winning the heavyweight title than anyone else in the world. You agree with that, Joe? I agree with that. In the, uh, he was kind of like a father to you. He was. In, in the fighting years ahead, you and Jack Blackburn, as well as John and Julian here, uh, have your sights set on only one goal, the heavyweight championship of the world. Thank you, John Roxborough and Julian Black. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you and all the uh, gang here will get
get a chance to talk over old times at the party in your honor at the Astor Hotel here, which provided accommodations for our guests and are this your life staff members. Well, it took three years and 35 fights for you to get a crack at the world title, Joe. You battered your way uh, past such ring stalwarts as Primo Canera, King Levinsky, Max Bear, Jack Sharkey, winning all but one of those 35 fights, 29 by knockouts. And the only one you lost? I won that one on June 19, 1936, <laughs> at Yankee Stadium in New York. Yes, he's here, Joe, himself, a former world heavyweight champion from Hamburg, Germany, the black oh. Yulon of the Rhine, Max Well, now, Max Schmeling, at the age of 31, you accomplished the impossible. You stopped the 22-year-old Joe Lewis's reign of terror. How'd you do it? Well, I hope you don't want me to repeat the whole fight story. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hit Joe in the fourth round with a right to his head. Mm -hmm. And that was this sudden round. Mm -hmm. But up to then, it didn't look so very good for me. <laughs> Joe had a very good left hand, and I couldn't get away from it. <laughs> but then in the fourth round, my big chance came. You remember, Joe, I told you, I have seen a half year ago before we fought, I have seen him fighting Paulino, and he made some mistake. He's dropping his hand, his left. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the chance, when I crossed him, when I hit him right on the chin, no, not on the chin, a little bit higher, <laughs> and down Joe went. I stopped, when I started my corner, I thought maybe the fight is over, but all of a sudden, you got up, after a count of two, very early. Yes, and for and eight more rounds. I was very surprised. <laughs> but for eight more rounds, Joe, you stood up to a beating seldom seen in ring history, proving once and for all that you could take it as well as dish it out. Well, he dished it out at night, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, uh, what about this fella, Mike? Well, well Joe, Joe Luz is a great friend, and he's a, the biggest sportsman and the finest sportsman I ever met. Joe, all good luck to you and to your family. Well, thank you, Mike. Right. It was the first time in your professional ring career, Joe, that you were ever counted out. You, Max Schmeling, staged one of the greatest upset victories in ring history. And two years later, though, you got your revenge, didn't you, Joe? I was lucky the two years later. Uh, <laughs> you knocked Max out in the first round on June 22nd, 1938, again at Yankee Stadium. We want to thank you, Max Schmeling, a great champion, for coming all the way from Germany to be with Joe tonight. Well, I'm very glad I came over from Germany, took the long way, and Fishing Joe, the best of luck, and after we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, each other so many years, no. not we didn't see no, this enough, right. but sometimes the English uh, language you is a very hard language, sir. You're doing all right. Joe, good luck to you. Thank you, Mike. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Max Bailey. Thank you. Max interrupted a... Uh, vacation, we finally found him in Switzerland to get oh. him here. This stunning defeat delays your championship quest for a year until the bright lights of Comiskey Park in Chicago spotlight you, Joe, and... Jim Braddock. This was the night of June the 22nd, 1937. Another world heavyweight champion, another friend, James J. Braddock. Jim? Oh, Jim, I... <laughs> As the then champion, Jim, and thinking of Joe's terrific record, were you at all worried about meeting uh, Joe in the ring? Well, Ralph, no. I, after having him down the first round, I figured that that was my night I was going to take Joe, but he got up off the floor, and he came right at me. And the fight was pretty even up until the eighth round, and all of a sudden, he hit me with a short right hand. You better ask him about the rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened after that is history, Jim. You were out for better than two minutes from that short, rocket-like blow, and Joe Lewis was the new heavyweight champion, but he won from a great champion, Jim Braddock. Wonderful to have you with us here tonight. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. Champion at 23, Joe Lewis, you're willing and always eager to meet all comers. With your country at war in 1942, you fight Buddy Bear on January 9th, and you turn over your whole purse to Navy relief. Three days later, you become Private Joseph Lewis Barrow, and on March 27th, you fight Abe Simon, this time turning your purse over to Army relief. For this fight, you buy 3,000 tickets so that your buddies at Camp Dix can see the fight free. Now, what your presence in the Army and your many exhibition fights did for the war 
Time morale can never be measured, Joe. On September 23rd, 1945, you're awarded the Legion of Merit. And two weeks later, now Staff Sergeant Joe Lewis Barrow, <laughs> you're honorably discharged from the Army. On March the 1st, 1949, Joe Lewis, undefeated as champion, retired. After an elimination bout, I was declared his successor. One more heavyweight champion of the world, your good friend Joe, Ezard Charles. <laughs> His retirement, as her Joe suddenly learned that he owed the government a good deal of money and back income taxes. And to meet some of this indebtedness, he decides to return to the ring. So he challenges you, the champion, Ezard Charles. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we fought in New York on September 27, 1950. It was one of the saddest days in my life. You see, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> you see, Joe, uh, you see, Joe, you had been my inspiration since I was a kid. I knew how badly you needed to win, but I, but I was the champion now, and I had to defend my title. And I had to do my best to keep it. With anybody else in the ring, it would have been a been a great night for me, but with Joe Lewis, well, I want to cry when the announcer came at the end of the 15th round that I had won the decision. Your comeback <laughs> fails, Joe, but every penny of your purse goes toward paying off your taxes. Thank you, Ezard Charles, a great champ, too. Good luck in your new career as a wrestler with Al Haas Promotions. Uh, Ezard, he's a wrestler now, you know, doing well. Thank you very much, Ezard. Age, the stalking enemy of all great athletes, Joe, brings your ring career to its irrevocable end. A year later, in the eighth round of your fight with Rocky Marciano, when a looping right sends you through the ropes. This is the last punch you ever took. This was the night of October 26, 1951. But a champ is never really through, and neither is our story, and we'll come back to it in a moment. Meanwhile, here again is Bob Warren. And the good wishes of Manny Seaman, too, your trainer, whom you love very, very much. The emptiness of heart that every champion must feel when his career comes to an end, in your case, Joe, is more than filled by your wife, Martha, a successful attorney in Los Angeles. Here's Martha, <laughs> and by your two children of an earlier marriage, Jacqueline and Joe Lewis, Jr. of Chicago. Here's Jackie and Joe Lewis, Jr. This, uh, uh, what do we call you? Uh, Punchy. Punchy. And by your two foster children, Candace and Amber. <laughs> this is Candace, here is Amber. Joe, we all love you, and you still can't. <laughs> Enough love here to fill any heart, even one as great as yours, Joe Lewis. Now, we know that Martha will cherish the school charm bracelet telling the story of your life, designed especially for her, by uh, Marshall Jewelers of New York, who provide it. Now, we'll see that you get a fill of tonight's program, Joe, in this Bell & Howell 16-millimeter sound projector to show it on, the 16-millimeter electric eye movie camera, both furnished by Bell & Howell. Now, today, you're busy refereeing fights and making public appearances and uh, managing the Joe Lewis Milk Company of Chicago and uh, are associated with the Mammoth Life and Accident Insurance Company. In this way, you're paying off your tax indebtedness. Your spare time is spent watching television with a huge bowl of ice cream before you. So, now, kind of help out. RCA is replacing your old television set with this RCA Victor Wagner color set. Now you'll see all the NBC specials living color developed by RCA. And this ice cream, a gallon a day from Carnation. There you are, furnished by them. That'll work that out all right. Now, uh, we would like to commemorate your greatness in the ring with this portrait of you done by one of America's leading artists, David Immerman. It'll hang prominently with pride in Madison Square Garden, the scene of your triumph. There you are. This is your life, Joe Lewis. There is no greater tribute than that you have lived your life in honor, with respect for your fellow man, and for God, with great courage and a great heart. Good night. God bless you, well, Joe. You. You're a legend, boy. Travel arrangements for guests on This Is Your Life are provided by TWA, trying to airlines. You fly the Superjet, you fly the finest, and you fly TWA, the Superjet airline. Jim, come on.